to the regular city council meeting for Monday, January 27, 2020. Can we have the roll call, please? Council Member Condit. Here. Council Member DeRosset. Here. Vice Mayor Rhino. Here. Council Member Klein. Here. And Mayor Vieira. Here. Next, we will have the invocation by Pastor Dick Connors of the Series First Baptist, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we read in your Holy Scriptures that you desire prayers of all kinds to be made on behalf of all men, and especially for those who govern the affairs of people and for those in authority. So I pray this evening for this chamber and all those who are here that we might know your blessing through the faithful exercise of duty of these men and women that serve our city. I pray for each council member and the supporting staff that contribute to the process of governing series. Bring blessing to their lives as they officiate with fairness, with sensitivity to the people of our community, with minds and hearts to do right in your eyes. Show them favor and kindness as they seek to be wise in all their decisions. Pray also for our police officers and for our firefighters, who though we would have them stand at ready, often go unthanked and unappreciated as they ought to be. Give them grace and blessing as they protect and serve. I pray for the city of Ceres, for prosperity and safety, for peaceful relations among its citizens. Help us to remember to give thanks to you for all the benefits of living here in Ceres. Keep our attention on the things tonight that most be benef benefit toward a healthy community. And finally, I ask for blessing during each proceeding tonight. May we find a way to work cooperatively and for the good of all. I pray these things remembering all good things come down from you, the Father of lights, who sent the Son of God to save sinners like us. May you be pleased to use us for your eternal purposes. I pray in the name of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, we have no presentations this evening, so we will move to citizens' communication to council on matters not included on the agenda. While the city council welcomes and encourages participation in city council meetings, adopted rules allow no more than five minutes for non-expression or for excuse me for expression of non-agenda items. Matters under the jurisdiction of the city council and not on the posted agenda may be addressed by the general public. However, California law prohibits the city council from taking action on any matter which is not on the posted agenda unless it is determined to be an emergency by the city council. Citizens are entitled to address the city council on any agenda item subject to the five minute provision. At this time, is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak on a non-agenda item? If so, please come forth and state your name for the record. My name is Lee Brandt and I had uh incident at my house in my neighborhood and I just want to thank the powers to be that it was semi taken care of and they know who they are. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? I, uh, Don Donaldson. I had a bill come in and they they're charging me a hundred and some dollars for having my garbage can or discarded furniture. I had a deep freeze in my front yard and I had a $3,750 air conditioner in my front. That's not discarded. That's not discarded furniture. My uh, freezer went out and I lost a lot of meat and you can have the fire chief go through the logs and I had fire trucks coming up and down my road looking for a fire and I had the tri-tip stuck on the porch showing him and they come in with a, a SUV and I explained to him what happened. Then two days later my friend brought me a deep freeze. I got to get the deep freeze out of my garage to put that one in and I had a three and a half ton air conditioner. 
Having an air conditioner and you're owning houses is real simple because if one goes out, you just hook one up and you put it up there and you're through with it. You don't have to call somebody, or I'll, I, I'll do it myself anyway. But I'm going to pay this bill under protest because my wife is just about ready to go through. I don't know. So I'm going to pay this bill, but you can ask the police chief also when uh, the police, the cop come out there and, and tell me that it was refurbished. That was wrong. That, that was wrong. And I just got into a wreck. I just got into a wreck on Whitmore over there on, by Morgan. Some person ran into the back of me, and I just got home. And here they come up and say, I said, wait a minute, I just got into a wreck. Well, we're going to give you 10 days to get this cleaned up. I didn't even get released from the veterans in Livermore for 15 days. And I was out there cleaning up my yard when he come back by, and I had garbage all in my truck, and he seen it, and he wrote me up still. So I'm going to pay this bill under protest, and I want somebody to look into this real good because I think I was treated unfairly. And I'll go into this. Mike said if you leave a, a, a mattress on, on the sidewalk and it's enough to get a wheelchair through, then it's okay. That, that's, that's not okay. My was not on the street. It wasn't on the sidewalk. It was up in front of my wife's car. I, uh, I'm awful upset about about the things that I've been treated like this. It's wrong. And right there where Mike lives, he if he comes in and drive because he lives in a cul-de-sac and there's a van there that's got a regular house cord. Now you tell me that I can't leave my motorhome hooked up and I've got UL approved cords. And he's got a house cord. And I know Mike sees it every time he comes out of his, how does this happen? And, and the guy lives in that, in that van. I don't know where he relieves himself, but he lives in that van. So I, I, I y y you know, I don't know. I'm just uh, a little upset with everything like this. And uh, so I'm going to pay it because my wife is really scared. But I want somebody to look into it to see if I've been treated fairly. And I've got a lot of papers that I can, even the city manager wrote me a letter and, and, and apologized because they treated me wrong. But they're still doing it. Thank you. Mr. Wells, can you have someone look into that? Of course. Okay. And, and could we all know what the outcome is? Yeah. Yes. Is there anyone else? Um, good evening. My name is Sharon Chassa. Um, I live on um, Avenue de Rio, which is in Pierre, Canada. Um, an incident appear occurred um, this Friday, which actually um, in our neighborhood where a car came speeding into our neighborhood. I live on the edge, like on the corner house, and a car came speeding in, and it was supposed to make a turn, but by the way the turn is, it made a sharp turn, and it almost like hit my house. Um, as I was going up, this is the fourth time this happened. I've called the cops, and thankfully this time the cops did come and actually see the driver and everything, so they actually had proof. The cops actually gave me the C number, I believe that's what it's called when you call the cops. Um, but I, I just want like some type of um, a, a thing on the road or anything like a stop sign or a speed bump to slow down the drivers because in the evening, a lot of people are walking. There's children walking and my neighbors and everything. And I, I, when I was growing up, I didn't know that you could bring up these problems to the city council, but my neighbor told me and I thought it'd be important because we do have a lot of children on our neighbor, um, neighborhood and I would just like that our neighborhood would be safe and not that, this is the fourth time it almost happened. One time it almost collided into our house, but the, it, the driver was drunk and he like went off so the cops couldn't do anything. 
a second time it was nighttime, and the third time um, he hit my tree, so my tree split in half, and um, the city also came and said that we had to cut down the tree, so we took down the tree and everything, and there's, and this time there's no tree there to protect our house. So I'm afraid that my house will collide, but also that if my little cousins or my niece or nephew are outside, they could have hit like the children. And it was so scary because the drivers were also in high school. I known that they were freshmen and I was seniors. And so I was just afraid that they would have been hurt or anything, it could have been really bad. So I'm just hoping um, if there could be a speed bump or a stop sign or anything. Okay, Vice Mayor Rhino. Um, actually, I did bring this up with your particular incident with the um, city manager this morning and asked them what we could do. And the first step is that they will pull all the records of collisions in that area. And then if there were enough according to whatever the warrants are for that, then they would proceed to do um, a traffic. Traffic study for a the traffic area. traffic study. Correct. So we are aware of it and they're in the process of looking at it. Um, is a traffic spending um, one of those speed signs where it tells you the speed number or something? No. In our neighborhood, there was one. We, yeah, we did that a couple years ago. And but it was on the wrong side. Right. <laughs> and I explained that to him this morning, so. Yeah, this, this would be a study of the area to ensure what the traffic conditions are, what the accident conditions are, to see if there's something leading to that particular incident, and then go accordingly based on that information. Okay, but there's only one police report. Is that okay? It happened four times, though, but the police didn't come in time for it to. Happen. We'll look into all the information and we'll see what's appropriate for the area. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Sheila Brandt. Um, this, I guess, is an IT question. It's been in the news a lot where different um, cities are being held ransom because they, people are getting into their, um, I don't know, their network. And I was just wondering, if, does Ceres have any type of plan for that not to happen to us? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Our IT is very much aware of that situation and I'm not going to give away what we've done, but we have protected ourselves quite well in that situation. So we should be aware. We are, we are very well aware of that situation. Okay, and then I have another question. Um, the a bridge that goes over the river there on um, Mitchell, why is that green, I don't know what it's called, divider only up to the series side and then once it gets to series, it's not on there anymore? Are they gonna replace that, do you know? Because they clean <coughs> that whole bridge up is that a Caltrans? It's actually Stan Stanislaus County. Pardon me? Stanislaus County. Okay, do you know, are they gonna? Don't know the answer. I don't believe they're going to replace it. I noticed it was new, so I suspect that they went up to the county out of the city limit line and stopped, but I don't know. Yeah. It's glare protection, right. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Okay, we will move on to appointments and boards and commissions. We have one item, planning commission appointment. Um, we have uh, one planning commission uh, position that uh, the term had expired. We have had five applicants um, we had advertised for it. We had five applicants um, complete the um, application process and submit. Um, actually, we ended up with uh, only three taking part. Um, we, we had interviews scheduled. Um, one withdrew his application, one did not show up. So there were um, three applicants that um, the vice mayor and myself interviewed. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that all of the three candidates were very strong um, and would make great planning commission members. Um, I would I also indicated to all of them that um, you know, if they are not selected, we do have two uh, upcoming 
uh, appointments to the Measure H committee, as well as I believe there's a current opening on the um, Animal Services, Animal Services, Services committee and the and a Measure, L Measure L Oversight, correct? Oversight committee. Um, you know, so you know there, there's there's plenty of opportunities for everyone. Um, but after interviewing all of the applicants, um, both the vice mayor and I felt that um, Mr. Brett Silvera would, would be um, a, a good candidate for the planning commission. So um, with that, I would say that I would recommend uh, his appointment. Uh, if I don't know if there's any questions any of the council members have. Uh, due to my relation to one of the applicants, I'll be abstaining. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Then I'll look for either a motion or denial or other recommendation. I'll make a motion to con <coughs> excuse me concur with the mayor's recommendation of Brett Silvera for the planning commission. And I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Can we have the roll call vote, please? Council Member DeRosset? Yes. Vice Mayor Rhino? Yes. Council Member Klein? Yes. And Mayor Vieira? Yes. Motion passes 4 0 with one abstention by Council Member Condit. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we will move on to the consent calendar. All matters listed on the consent calendar are considered routine in nature and will be enacted by a single motion unless otherwise requested by an individual council member or the public for special consideration. Otherwise, the recommendation of staff will be accepted and acted upon by roll call vote. This time, is there anyone on the council that would like one of the eight consent calendar items pulled for further discussion? Okay, and is there anyone in the audience that would like one of the consent calendar items pulled? Okay, hearing none, I'll bring it back to the council for direction. Move to approve one, two, three, A, four, five, A, B, C, D, E, six, seven, and eight. Second. Can we have a motion and a second? Can we have the roll call vote, please? Council Member Condit? Aye. Council Member DeRosset? Yes. Vice Mayor Rhino? Yes. Council Member Klein? Yes. And Mayor Vieira? Yes. Motion passes 5 0. Okay, we have no unfinished business, no public hearing, no new business. We have one discussion item the City of Series Municipal Code Revision Discussion Group 5, Title 18 Zoning. Mr. Wells? Here we go. Testing, testing. All right, as I've been indicating in our little analogy here of the mountain that we are climbing, we have now reached the top of that mountain in terms of the uh, mountain of paperwork. So uh, as we hit Title 18, the, all of the titles will have now have been at least discussed with the city council. So just a refresher, the 16 titles of the municipal code, we have hit on all of them, and this will be the last one for discussion. The rest of them, as shown here, we've completed those first four groups We're in progress on the others, and then here we are this evening discussing group five, which is title 18. So just a refresher of the schedule, uh, we'll cover that kind of at the end of the meeting as well, or what's next step. But this evening, discussion for title 18, and as I mentioned, it's a very large title, 334 pages is the current draft. And we'll jump right into some of the issues that we've addressed, and then we'll look for council direction on this item. <coughs> so as it's referred to, Title 18 is really the zoning code or the zoning ordinance, which is reflective of all of the rules and requirements regarding uses of property within the city. Primarily, the overall uh, tenor and tone of the zoning ordinance has not really changed substantially, um, mostly updated for current law and reflecting the changes that have happened since the last time this code was um, comprehensively updated. We also looked at it in relation to our general plan to ensure that the changes in general plan will now be reflective here in the zoning code. So the uh, process, just like we've done with others, uh, started with the city attorney, who sent the document back to us after a red line. We made comments, sent it back to them, another iteration back with staff. And she'll, you'll see in the document are still some red line comments uh, showing that, that dialogue back and forth between the city attorney uh, and primarily for the zoning code was myself, uh, Mr. Michaels, uh, who's here in the audience, as well as Mr. Westbrook. Um, 
the three of us tend to spend the most time, especially uh, James and Tom spending the bulk of the time in these items, is this is where most of the entitlement questions come in. So most of those comments will be between the three of us. We met internally as well as with our legal team to um, work through all these issues and get them to the form that it's in this evening. Um, as with the past, this is still a draft document, so there's still um, plenty of changes that need to be be made before it comes back through the process of a public hearing and then officially uh, adopting it uh, as an ordinance. So we'll jump into a few of the changes. The first one I'll mention uh, that was a mistake on my part. Um, we were trying to add a new title um, for R5, which is a high density residential um, component section of the code, and it got missed in some iterations between us and the city uh, attorney. So and it was missed on my, my part. Tom did his part. I didn't get it inserted in there and it got missed. So that's something we'll be adding um, to reflect the housing element. So in our housing element, we had to have a, something in our municipal code zoning for something above a density of 20 units. So this R5 category, consistent with our general plan, uh, will be added to the, the muni code. It'll read very similar to the other code sections that you've read of R3 and R4. It'll just be reflective of that higher density. So, um, Moving through the other items, uh, chapter 40 of the new, toad, it, new code um, is moved from Title V. That's the dancing provisions that were previously in um, that business license and regulation section. So moved here per the council's direction. Um, if you look at the first page of the zoning code, there's one, pay, one chapter, chapter 10 currently, that seems a little bit out of place as it's right in the middle of the other residential zones. So we're recommending to move that down in its order so that it doesn't fall. And this is the parking and storage of recreational vehicles and recreation zones, uh, residential zones, sorry. It doesn't quite fit where it's laid out today. So we're gonna move that down, um, down probably around chapter 23, right before off-street parking and loading standards, which we think is a better, uh, more efficient and logical layout for where that uh, chapter should be. So a couple changes right off the top. Um, quite a bit of expansion and definitions throughout the document, moving the definitions all into one section up in the front. So you'll notice the, the definition portion of this document is many, many pages, over, over, t over 30, I believe, um, pages of definitions. So those are important. Uh, those definitions flow through the whole 300 pages. So those definitions are critical and they were updated. The example I mentioned there for ADUs or accessory dwelling units, state law changed we needed to update our definition of that, and that's reflected in the document. Also made changes throughout the document um, relative to the methadone clinics. As the council recalls, that particular item was not identified. It is now in the zoning code as something that would require a CUP. So the requirement of a conditional use permit would now be for methadone or clinics or anything of similar use. One of the bigger uh, changes is the reflection uh, in the ordinance regarding the sign code and quite a bit of language we had to change to be reflective of a court case that was uh, pretty significant in the regulation of signs uh, in the Reed versus Town of Gilbert, which is really cascaded through a lot of local governments on how we regulate signage. So a lot of the, the comments from our legal team uh, in the sign portion of the ordinance is relative to be consistent with that um, aspect of, of case law. It was handed down in 2016, maybe? 16, yeah. And then a couple of last little changes. Um, free, freeway oriented sign changes, so this would be your monument signs. Um, think of this something similar to what is in Turlock by Monta Vista Crossings, those large monuments are today. We have a pretty stringent limit on monument signs. Those, what, are, what you see in Turlock, would not be allowed under our existing code. So we are proposing some changes uh, to allow a little more flexibility for those freeway-oriented signs. That different than what uh, is in the current code for billboards. So this would be a separate monument sign code with a change. And we can get into those details, but just kind of hitting the highlights. Um, myself, Mr. Westbrook, and answer any of those specific questions. And the last one uh, is fence heights and residential zones. So. As the code reads today, fence heights um, between residential properties is six feet. Um, what we're recommending based on some interactions and code enforcement and others is to change that to seven feet. The issue that we have on a regular basis is someone replaces their fence and they put a different size kickboard. So i.e. on the bottom of your fence, most people will put a, a six inch or a 12 inch kickboard and put their fence pickets above there. And most of those fence pickets are, are 
built or cut to six feet to start with. So when you put them on top of a, a uh, kickboard on the bottom, you're already over the six feet. And depending on he, how you are relative to your um, back or side yard neighbor, there could be an elevation difference between those two properties up to a foot. So depending on what side you measure the fence, you could have a, a foot difference and then you're already over the six foot maximum that we have today. So we're recommending uh, to change that to seven feet um, to give a little bit of flexibility for the overall um, iteration between property owners. It should cover most situations. So um, that's a couple of the, the bigger issues. Again, there's 334 pages. We'll go as far as the council wants to go through this. If it gets to be too much, we can push off to the next meeting or go as far as you can or as long as you want. So turn it over to any council questions. Tom, did you want to add anything relative to the yeah, just um, just briefly on the the sign, uh, the the freeway oriented sign. We heard through the general plan update process that the council and the planning commission both wanted some more um, latitude. And so, what's being recommended is a sign height of up to 85 feet. Um, current code only allows 50, and then the square footage allowance is 180 square feet today, and we're recommending 500, about two and a half times more. So, um, that puts us more in line with uh, the neighbors within the county. So you're looking for direction on how we want to handle this? Uh, want to start want with their sticky pad? Their just <laughs> go. Hey, I see a bunch of. Uh, I don't have as trees. many as Linda. I don't have as many as Linda. Whoever why wants to start why first. Why don't we start, and then if you have something at my page, then you interject, or we start, and I. Well, you've always started, so let you go first. Okay. But I start on page three. Well, then you should start. I start on page 24. I just, I'm just asking on page three, um, the comments that were made uh, towards the bottom. Um, please explain, are you talking just RVs or side yard? For the side yard or all structures? Um, There's a comment that was made about um, adding a definition based on a nuisance. Yes, yeah, so the we basically expanded the definition there. Apologize for the glasses. I'm getting old. I can't see this stuff back and forth. And I'm blaming it on the Muni code. So back and forth is Muni code. It's all, it's all the Muni code's fault for losing my eyesight. Um, so the provisions here is expanding that definition so that it could apply to um, the ability for someone to put a covered area adjacent to their property for the storage of an RV. That's what the, that, that conversation you're seeing is that, that expanded definition storage for everything or just an rv it when could I, when, be okay so yeah. here's 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 my question why okay there's a lot of people that have rv covers and they go right up against the fence line but then there's other people that put um a structure that goes from their house to their friend's fence line that is maybe eight feet seven feet off the ground they put um vines on it and stuff that are a nuisance to their neighbors tom you want to I think that this um, this expanded language uh, was something that we tried to come up with to address, address one of the concerns of one of our constituents that would come to these meetings about these types of structures. And so what we're trying to do is allow provisions to say that if you have a side yard that's big enough that you could have a cover, an accessory cover in that area to cover your boat, your RV, your trailer, whatever it is. Um, certainly those structures, um, they're accessory by nature. Um, in discussions with the fire chief, certainly somebody building something on one side of the home, we want to make sure that the other side has a clearance so that our fire guys could get to the rear yard. Um, a lot of times when you have these types of covers and trailers and so forth on one side, it's very difficult for somebody to get around the trailer on one side. So the definition here is trying to give some provisions to address existing conditions and the de desires of some of our folks in the community to actually have these types of structures on the side of their house. So it, it, it would only apply when you had enough room to not encroach into setbacks. So it does not apply to like a, a lean? A five foot side yard setback, it wouldn't apply to that. Okay. Is it side yard or is it behind your it, fence? It could be rear yard. Side yard or rear yard is what is the definition. So side yes. yard is in front of your fence? No, behind your fence. Behind your fence. Side yard setback generally is from the extension of the house the forward yeah. extension of the house. So, so these wouldn't be permitted in the front. They would have to be in, in either the rear yard or the side yard. But are they now, according to this, would you be able to build up closer to your neighbor's fence or is there still? As an accessory structure, you could. You can now build up to your fence? With this definition, yes. Can you build 
from your fence to your house without? No, you, if it's connected to your house, have to be five feet away. This is an accessory structure, so it wouldn't be connected to the house. Okay. So it's limited in where it would actually apply. But, but if it's up against your common fence with your neighbor, you could conceivably have a solid structure, right? That could be five feet from your house, and it could cover all the way up to your fence of your, between you and your neighbor, and it could be a solid structure. Yes, so if we're looking to give provisions to folks to be able to do these things, then the setback almost becomes a moot point. So if it's an accessory structure and it's six inches away from your house and six inches from your fence, then that's what it is. Um, and that's it, legal? According today to it's not. With okay. this, yeah, today it is not, but with today this definition, not. we're trying to encompass that. So um, certainly, if, if we don't change this, condition then they would have to be five feet away from the fence whether they were connected or not this just is providing some flexibility to the residents who may desire to do something in their side yard well i picture though if you use your backyard and your neighbor decides they're going to build how tall can this be 15 feet uh yeah have to be less than 15 feet yep 14 feet 14 okay. feet yes so say you use your backyard for entertaining and now your neighbor has decided that they want to build an RV cover but they really don't have an RV. And so it's going to go up to your fence, right? And it can be 14 feet tall and then that's what you're going to look at when you're outside entertaining in your backyard. Could be a, a solid whatever the structure is, correct? Yes. Okay. No, I don't like that. And I do. I, I, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather look at that than some of my, nothing against my neighbors, but I'd, I'd rather look at that than their backyard. I don't want to see what's going Can on Can you there. see over their six or seven foot fence? Now we're talking about something that's- Yeah, and sometimes I probably don't want to. <laughs> okay, but now you're, now you're gonna talk about yeah. something that's gonna go up 14 feet. Picture that. Not, not six or seven feet, we're talking a solid- You've gotta give Don somewhere to move his. RV. <laughs> Sorry, Don. But he's not going to cover it if it's back there. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking that if I want to be in my backyard enjoying it, I don't know that I want to see however long this can be, 14 feet tall and a solid structure. So this is the definition we're talking about. If you would like to put some conditions on accessory buildings, we can do that in the appropriate section. So this is just the definition. So we could leave this definition either as open as we've done it or leave it a little more constrained and then provide specific conditions that the council's comfortable with in that particular section. That's probably, rather than get hung up on the definition, the definition can be probably drawn back a little bit and then provide some of the uh, criteria to limit the situation. So again, we're trying to provide some flexibility here, but without opening Pandora's box for every potential situation where someone could basically enclose their entire backyard and their entire side yard. That's not what's intended here um, and but, with but the, the, the way this is written they could no because you're still going to have certain percentage of it open there's other right? provisions of the code of covered that would, would right. come into the definition play. of the code covers you can only have 55 percent covered yeah so there's some 40 percent 40 percent 40 percent a lot coverage oh 40 percent okay yeah. a lot coverage. so there's so there's other things that come into play I so I, I maybe page 10 there. so if i'm here in the council you'd like this definition to be looked at and then provide some maybe some criteria in the accessory building component to provide some I'm okay limitations with it. I, I there. I'm okay it, with it. I'm okay with it as I'm okay is. with it as well. You're okay with it as, as written, as drafted? Correct. I'd kind of side with Linda though, just in the fact of, you know, what if these people start building things so, and they don't even have an RV? Yeah, so what and we can- it, And it's 14 feet tall. I mean, that's- Well, I, we I'm can define that. visualizing- Again, that could be defined in the code as well. If, if 14 feet is uncomfortable, that can be lower than for an accessory building. Yeah, accessory buildings today are 15 feet um, to the top of the, to the height. Um, some of these covers that cover um, a motorhome per se, or could be 11 to 12 feet tall, just to get the motorhome underneath. 
So if I hear in the council, I think there's three of you say leave the definition as is. Is there direction you'd like to see some criteria under this area to make sure it's tight enough that we don't get a Pantoard box? Is that fair or not? I think you should. I'd say leave it and we'll address it if something comes up. I agree. Okay. So before so it comes up, before it gets built? I'm just glad I don't live next door to you. That's all I want to say. Okay, page 10. There's a comment in here about striking out um, um, cottage food industry. If you, if you strike it out, does that leave the door open to sell directly out of the residence? No, it's already, it's just moving it from the definition. All of this information is incorporated in the body of the document. It's just moving it out of the definition. Right now we have a very, very long definition. We just move that into the body of that section. Roman 36, no. Okay. On page 24 for um, definitions, why is medical marijuana dispensaries lined out for the definition? Yeah, so per... Um, legal after reviewing this a couple times, our definition and requirements in um, chapter five cover this so it doesn't need to be covered in the zoning code. Okay. Page 26, there's a lot definition. And is that lot definition for mobile homes or is it for all. It's for all because you'll see those phrases throughout the entire document. So would that be would that be in a better place if it was moved up to where we actually are talking about lot definitions instead of behind mobile homes? Yeah, it's just where it fit formatting wise. Okay. We're, we're likely going to replace that exhibit right now. It's just a PDF that kind of gets stuck and so all with the formatting stuff kind of moves around so once we finalize we will we'll get a better illustration there um, that will stick closer to lot definition okay and then on page I think it's your turn I'm a 30 I'm on 37 yep page 37 the last uh, two bullet points where it says temporary use so how does that how does that address the street vendors That would be separate. The street vendors would have their own permitting. This temporary use would be with an ad, a, uh, administrative use permit. Again, that's just a definition. So this would be like your, your firework stands and your um, Christmas tree lots. So you're talking just seasonal type vending? Yeah, we might need to, might need to check that B. A is fine, but B we may need to check. Well, and that's where I got my little asterisk is yeah. on B. We'll, we'll double check that relative to, to Title V. Okay. Yeah, I think Toby, when when B was created years ago, it was for the folks that were selling uh, flowers from like yes. flower shops. We'll probably stuff. need to put a reference there to uh, tie that to Title V, where the uh, business license requirements are. Page forty three, eighteen oh three point oh six zero. It's just a typo. The city council may form a committee. Informed should be deleted. Okay, page 49, 1804-170 for site plan approval. Um, it's deleting the planning commission shall not take action on an application for site plan approval unless the applicant is present at the meeting. Why are we deleting that? So the, on the basis of legal direction, they uh, think it may be difficult if we were challenged on that to just change the language to encourage the applicant's attendance at planning commission, but not to require it. So that, you'll see that comment kind of throughout the document. Okay. So is the language going to be in there to encourage? It is. It's there already. It's, already it's there. under D. Yeah. If they're dumb enough not to show up, <laughs> they could end up with a lot of conditions. Right. Or a denial, I suppose. Correct. Or a denial. Correct. Yes. Where are you at? 79. Okay, page 56, 1806050E. Um, prohibited uses, I don't see, I see metal buildings, except for accessory buildings used exclusively for storage. Is that where we should prohibit the pod or the storage containers? Well, this is in the community facilities zone. 
Okay. So that would only be applicable to anything with a community facility zoning designation. So it wouldn't, I think your pod, you're talking about shipping container stores that are in residential. So that would be something that would likely go in the single family criteria would be my likely location. Okay, I'll save that sticky then. Okay, that one Tom explained to me already, so we'll move on. That was about the 12 foot. Oh, no, 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 we need to go back because. Then we need to make an edit there, right? We need to make an edit yep. because it, wherever Pinch. the discussion was about the three three car garage, it should have been left in and it was deleted. Which, which page was that on, do you recall? I didn't note that one. Tom no. and I did discuss it today, but I did not note the page. Um. It might be on page 66. So that's the RA zone? It, it's, it's actually it's in, in the R1. It's, R1. it's, an R1. it's on page 81. So we're not there yet? Okay. No. All right. Continue. OK. Page are you on? Seventy nine. Okay. Go ahead. Seventy nine. It's eighteen oh eight oh five zero. Because it's been brought up before the council before, how does this address commercial use trailers? You know, there's a gentleman that, that has a um, gooseneck trailer that uses it for commercial use and parks it in front of his house at times? Well, this is the residential zone, so this wouldn't be, wouldn't reflect, this particular zone wouldn't reflect parking of trailers that would fall under um, that other section, I believe. I mean, it's, it's a temporary park, it's a commercial, you know, fifth gooseneck that he, you know, but I know that Mr. Warren has brought that up a couple of times about the parking. I don't believe trailer. this would be the right location, but we will double check that question. Okay. So we're in the R1 zone, and that would be where if we wanted to um, not allow the pod or storage container, would that be where that would go? That would be one location. But and would you allow a pod temporarily? Well, that would be the issue, but this was a picture that I had hoped Toby would be able to share, but he isn't able to, but this is in a front yard. And that would never, we would never permit that. The question is whether we want to explicitly call that out as not allowed. Um, so that's temporary, right? Um, well, but even it's been that, at least three weeks. We, would, we would determine that, we, we are opening a code case on that one, but we would determine that to be a nuisance regardless of any other criteria to the others that's clearly a nuisance I mean, that but is there any way that someone could read the code under r1 and think that they could put a pod and leave it there indef indefinitely i don't believe so but we can we can double check to make sure there's provisions in there for for pod storage to to not so that there's some expectation of what that is i know we've had this question before yeah and and just to um kind of follow up on the, the photo that you showed me earlier, the, those shipping containers, um, those aren't allowed on any portion of any property that's zoned R1. So if somebody had one in the backyard, that's still not allowed. Right. Yeah. Oh, they're not even allowed in backyards? No. I mean, it, it's a shipping container. If you don't want it on the property, you don't want it on the property. What if it's been shipping container that's been modified into a building structure? That's new. Uh, Right. haven't seen one yet that's happened that way. I know that they... No, but they I mean, I, I'm just thinking of what Mr. Parsons has done with yep. and made those things. If he wanted to plop, I mean, he's not in the city, but if someone wanted to plop it down and it looks like a structure, does it... I think, that not, there's, I think there's provisions in the building code that are allowing those, but that all happens with the permit process, and under that scenario, it probably wouldn't look like a shipping container at right. all. It'd it look doesn't. like a, so. a more traditional 
um, accessory dwelling unit. In, the, in this case, it, it's clearly not allowed. That, that's okay. something is, it's not, you would never permit anything like that. Okay, on page 82, under H1, it, it seems like in all the other zone districts that were, well, condos have been deleted, but why would, can you have a group dwelling or a condo in an R1, a condo? No, no. So, not in, not so in R1. should that be stricken on page 82 for population density for site plan approval before any group dwelling, condominium, or non-residential building is erected? If we're talking about the R1 zone. Well, technically, you could have a condominium that is that meets that definition, right? So condominium is a type of land use. So most people think of condos as high rise, but it's, cons well. A single family it, home in a condo? I mean, I. It, it's, it's possible, but it's definitely not so, so very the word, reality. Okay, so condo should stay in there. I mean, I questioned it's, it because it didn't look right in R1. Again, it's conceivable, but I mean, I, I think in I think under our provisions here, it would be extremely difficult to have a condominium project in the R1. So probably striking it isn't a bad. I don't thing. think it's going to hurt anything, but I don't think it I don't think it hurts one way or the other. I don't okay. think it leads someone to think they can do a condo because all of the other provisions lock you out of that in an R1 zone. Okay. Page eighty-three, two. Front yard and exterior side yard areas of single family homes shall be appropriately landscaped. What is appropriate? Is that when you go when you go down further and it just says fifty percent shall be maintained as landscape area? Who de who determines what appropriate is? That's the the million dollar question, Tom. I know we've we've wrestled with this. I think it, this this is more intended for. Um, trying to prohibit people from concreting their entire front yard, I think is why we put this provision in. Um, appropriately landscape, sure there's some controls when a home is brand new and, and under construction for us to, uh, to say what's appropriate um, decades later um, and multiple homeowners later. It's difficult to say um, what, what's appropriate. Um, generally it's grass and trees and maybe some shrubs and so, uh, this definition is really trying to capture the other half of that where folks say, I'm just going to pave m the, the entirety of my front yard. Okay. Would you like us to look at that, that definition? I would. Yeah. 80, page 84. Uh, K, fourth line, is just a typo. You have the word uh, six foot spelled out, but then when the numericals are in there, you crossed out the six and put seven, so it was just typographical. Got it. Page 100. About the eighth sentence down. There shall not be more than two recreational vehicles parked or stored within the front or exterior side yard of the property. So if you can have two and you could park it on your side yard and in your driveway, Right, you could do that instead of, and then a car, or you could just have the whole front of your garage area with vehicles. I believe this is the existing. Well, it's underlined. But it's the way it comes across from the previous version. Um, Tommy, yeah, I think that there was, you know, the, the potential that somebody had a cargo trailer and a boat in the front of their house. I mean, if it's one, doesn't necessarily make a difference to me. It was just trying to give some flexibility, but under the circumstance, if they had a side yard, they could have a trailer in the side yard, a boat in front of that in the driveway, and then another RV vehicle. So typically, they, I mean, somebody could conceivably have three on their property at one time. Under the current code, or uh, under the proposed code. Correct. Under the proposed, it's two. Mm -hmm. But currently, how many can they have? 
I don't believe there's a restriction. Okay. So I think that's why we were trying to put trying a number to in. Put that okay. as specific as possible so that someone couldn't stack three boats. Can you add li livestock trailers in there too? Because that's what my question was for, for that section too. Well, th is this about recreational vehicles? Right. This is a, the whole section, the whole chapter is about recreation vehicles. So it wouldn't, you would be excluded from that. Unless it's an RV trailer for your cows. Oh. <laughs> I think that's a stretch. So I think that's I, a difficult I guess definition. I guess it's what the council wants if they want to allow two or one. Currently, we don't believe there's a limitation. Okay. So this, we think, is a little more flexible at the same time putting some outside parameters on it. So two is better than unlimited. That, that's a council policy decision. See, and that's our yeah, the one shot. The one size fits all is kind of hard. I mean, I mean, I try to think of the large residential neighborhood of Mitchell and River Road, and if they have a giant driveway and they've got a boat and boat skidoos, they also I mean snowmobiles. I mean, I understand what you're talking about, um, but on one hand, I mean, I could see it both ways. And, and again, it's a discussion, so I mean, this, we could leave the language as is, and you can chew on it when it comes back for public hearing. There's still, you've got two more chances to, to make some changes here, and you can take public comment and decide that you want to. Do you like leaving it unlimited, or do you like it? Well, limited? I think it should be unlimited to a degree, because there's people that have an RV trailer, boat, skidoos, you know, there's snowmobiles. I mean, when you start looking at that, most of the time they're going to put something in storage. Well, no, but they can put as many as they want behind the fence. This yeah. is in the front yard, the the garage. You know, the the oh, driveway. The front yard. This is front the front. Yard. This isn't behind yeah. the fence. Okay. So this is, according to staff, they now could line up from their side yard and their two parking places on their driveway and line it all up with recreational vehicles and that would be okay. And what they're trying to say is to limit it to two, which maybe is better than what I was thinking is one because then at least they still, but you know what the problem is then? I just thought of this. If we require, do we require two on-site parking places for single family residential? Yes. Okay. So if we require two, and they've got two in the driveway, and then they have a side yard, but now we're going to say they can park two RVs, well, then they just now, or does that count as one of the parking spaces for their off-street parking? Are you it, talking? It really, it really doesn't because they're not moving it in and out. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So basically we're going against what our code says, that they have to have two parking spaces. And now if we say they can have two RV spaces, they could park one on the- We're not suggesting they can have two RV spaces. We're saying there can't be two RVs in the, in the uh, street side view. In the, in the what? So if they park the boat and the trailer in the driveway, that's perfectly fine. We're not suggesting they can build two. Oh, no, I understand that. But what I'm saying is that those two places are meant for their cars, correct? I mean, isn't that the intent? Your garage is meant for your cars, well, too. Well, that's true. <laughs> and mine, mine do go in the garage, that, that's the okay? Two, that's the two required spaces okay. in the garage. That was my question, the two required. Is it the garage it, or the, is it the driveway? Two covered parking spaces, generally that's going to okay. be accomplished All in right. your driveway and then the two, uh, or in the garage and then two in the driveway. So essentially, you have four parking spaces if you have a two-car garage. Okay, thank you. So we're okay leaving it as is? We still want to chew on it a little bit and we can read it. I think probably the two is okay. Two is better than unlimited, I think, for the front yard. I'd go with that. Two. Okay. Council Member Klein. I'm still mulling it. Okay, Which so is I fine. Guess so we'll leave the language as is and you'll, you'll still have the opportunity at the public hearing and then the second public hearing if changes are required or directed. What's your next page? I'm on 133. I am too. Go ahead. My question is, as when it talks about a security plan, so what made the requirements set at 50? 
Why can't we set it if it's more than one residential dwelling? You know, like apartment <coughs> complex? If there's multiple apartment complex dwelling, that it should have a security plan? Instead of 50, 50 units? This is in PC. Uh, I believe it would be Chapter 13, page so 33 e. on, I think, T, security plan. 133. Yes, yeah, so 133, the, sorry. This is only, uh, this is applicable under the PC, the plan, plan community zone with that particular limit, Tom. I, I, but I think this cascades it's totally throughout really. in the R3 and the R4 as well. Um, it's just an arbitrary number. Um, it can be set wherever Can we just sell, say, like, if it has two, you know, residential dwelling structures like in a, in, in a multifamily, you know, like apartment complexes with, per di you know, density. City Attorney, is there any issues relative to the numbers or account that's say 10 units or 15, no, 20? I, I, would, I would recommend against two, me, meaning having a number that low, just because if we're talking about multiple family residential complexes, are we talking about duplexes? It sounds like you're talking about I'm talking larger. about apartments. Right. So anything higher than than that would be fine. Again, it's it's a policy you, question. You want to get away from yes. duplex, triplex yes. before you want to get above that number. So I would say if you wanted that lower go a number, it would probably wouldn't go below ten. Um, you ten units because that's getting down into Well can you can we specify that for apartment complexes? I believe the language is in there. It's currently yep. at 50 in all the other zones. And so essentially, if that change is made to whatever number it is, we would just, we would just all the way take that all the way through. Globally change it for everything. But you're speaking about specifically calling out apartment complexes Correct. as like an example. Correct. Right. Yeah. But in this case, we yes. any multifamily residential, right. we, would, we would want that same provision to apply across. Mine either. I'm, uh, whatever the will, that's fine. So I'm just asking a question. I mean, typically, for any multifamily, um, you know, multifamilies aren't typically going to pencil for development below a 50 unit count. Um, it's got to be a pretty unique situation, although if SB 50 passes, it might be a different story. Um, but it won't matter anyways because we won't have any jurisdiction. Sorry, I digress to a little state issue. Carter, so I had a question for you. How many security plans have we gotten? I think one in the time that I've been here, because most of the complexes have been smaller than 50 units. And Mr. Collins, or Chief Wise, are, are, would you go through those security plans? I mean, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is what are we going to do with this document? Are we going to tell people how to do the security? Or is it because the reality is if I'm a buyer or a resident there and I would be the one forcing the security plan, but if we're going to force them to do a security plan and we're going to take the document and just throw it on the, you know, on the desk and nobody's going to look at it because it doesn't really benefit us, I, I don't know what the benefit of it I is. I think this is probably a holdover from former codes. I think that the California Building Code tells us a lot of life safety issues now and buildings are just designed that way. Um, any of the owners? willing to put in a significant investment into a multifamily uh, property are going to secure their property in the manner they see fit. So right. under that scenario, I don't know if there's a lot of value in this. Um, th this yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming through the building, you know, plan checking and everything else, we're going to see what kind of security features they have or we're going to mandate those. I, I mean, I don't know who prepares a security plan. Is, is there a firms that do that or a registered professional security <laughs> yeah. plan prepared, <laughs> I I just, I'm just trying to look at it and say what's the value in that an I RSP mean, I'm not going to go buy in there or live in there if it if I don't feel secure and I don't need a plan to tell me that, that that's just my I'm just trying to be practical here yeah. if, if, if we're not going to use it then strike it I mean well do you think I have no problem striking it. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Mayor, but I have no problem striking it. I just asked the question because the number was thrown out there. Do you think, Tom, that originally the security plan was so if something bad happened in the complex then 
fire police have some plan that they can look at? I mean, is that the intent, you think? Perhaps it could have been some type of evacuation plan or in the event of an emergency, but what happens? But we have that now. If something happens, they usually contact engineering or building and get the same information, correct? Yep. Yeah. yeah so. We're then generally... Then strike it out. Yeah, we're reviewing the site plans early in the entitlement process for any of those particular issues from an access or any of those. So I, I think in today's day and age, I, I, I don't think there's any issue from city attorney of striking that. I mean, if it was an evacuation plan or something like that, I, I could more I could understand that. Right. But a security plan, are we looking for where they're going to put alarms? What type of security are we looking for? Yeah, without specific criteria, it doesn't seem to have much value. Yeah. So we're comfortable. We will strike that across the board in all of those zones. Page 133, recreational vehicles. And I'm assuming that those are prohibited because it's the PC zone. Would that be why? That's, okay. I believe that where that, where that came from. So yep. In that particular zone. Because don't they typically have a separate storage area or something? Yeah, they, that's typically what they have in some of those uh, condominium projects. They have an area where they can park and store their RVs for that complex. Okay, thank you. Page 148 and 49. Please explain to me the difference between B4 and B17 um, as it is in 1815020. Um, B4 says delicatessen um, that you shall. Oh, never. Um, wait a minute. I, I read it wrong. I apologize. So scratch, scratch that. We're good. I lost one of my stickies. Oh, no. <laughs> hey, and I only got one more. Uh, I think it was the, there was a, um, I don't know if it's C1 or C2. It's about the traveling public. Which, which zone would that be? About the definition is the benefit of the traveling public. Probably commercial highway, I would guess. Uh, you know what? It's um, C2 community commercial. So, C2. Page. No, Sorry. that's not it. It's the one that's about the traveling public. And it said that a methadone clinic would be allowed. And I'm wondering why the traveling public needs a methadone clinic. Well, we put it in every. Okay. We put that in every zone. So we basically just blanketed every zone. Well, uh, but I didn't see methadone clinic in C2 page 161, I saw um, adult businesses, but I didn't see methadone. Oh, there it is. Okay. Never mind. It's there. Uh, w one thing I wanted to mention going back to the residential zones, I know that the council had some discussions on a projects, projects earlier this year about the multifamily, and I failed to mention this to Toby, um, bringing it up earlier on about the parking and so generally it was one and a half parking spaces per unit um, what we did and what we included in the code uh, was a one bedroom unit required one and a half spaces two bedroom units required two spaces and three bedroom units required two and a half spaces and so essentially it'll change the change the mix depending upon the how many of the, of the types of units so if they're all one bedroom uh, one bath It'd be pretty easy to calculate if they do have a mixture of some three uh, bedroom units then there would be a higher requirement for parking based upon the the actual bedroom count of an apartment complex so we provide a little bit more definition um, than we had previously that was one of my questions but that's the way i took it so yeah. so oh, in, in terms of the return to the methadone clinics are you okay with our blanket comment I mean, it's, it requires a CUP everywhere. Yes. So, okay, yes. just making sure. Page 206, handicap spaces. My question is, who governs how many handicap spaces for, for properties? The California Building Code. Okay. Thank you. Do you... Do we need a reference there or? No, or, I, okay, I, it just was just my question. own curiosity okay. about it. Um, under the zoning for the signs, I'm on page 
page 216, and I see windblown devices and signs. What about sign waivers? You know, the sign people? Are they exempt? I know I that in planning we always would tell people have. they couldn't have them, but I don't see it in the zoning ordinance. And what page was that again, Ms. Rhino? I'm on page 216. So Prohib you're looking at prohibited signs, yeah. So it starts on 215, so it's at the bottom of 215, and it goes into 216. But don't we prohibit the, the people standing on the corner with the signs and dancing around? I yes. Thought, yeah. Yeah, I we thought did. we did. Well, I, I thought we did too, but... No sign twirlers. I, that's what it's, the sign twirler. Yeah, I didn't see that. No either. automated sign twirlers either. Well, it says moving, swinging, rotating. Um, signs within the public right-of-way would get the sign twirlers because if they're standing on the sidewalk, we own it. Right. So, But, but, but you would like us to, we can add some. Yeah. Just say well, signs I within the public right-of-way, including but not limited to those folks twirling signs. You know, well, I think there. sign twirlers have, has to be pointed out there because they're not going to look and see if it's in the right-of-way or not. Right. Yeah, well, I think that's probably the right place to add it is there. We'll look at other, because I know Turlock just did a similar thing um, in their code, so we can <coughs> steal their language here as well. We'll uh, add. I had one on 209, there's a typo. 209, 18.25.030, first sentence. I think it's supposed to be from, not form. Yeah, yes. Page 217, should, aren't A-frames not allowed? Correct, they aren't. Okay, so did I miss where it says A-frames? I think it was the fireworks stand. Temporary signs may be displayed in conjunction with fireworks stands, but I don't see anything about a frame. And I can't believe it. Maybe it's in here and I just missed it. Under prohibited signs on page 216, uh, I just saw it here. F. F. Has a, it says including A-frame okay. signs. All right, thank you. And then one of Mr. Wells' discussion items, freeway oriented sign changes, height, square footage. That's page 223. It says um, an 85 feet in height, but then the last paragraph says the Planning Commission can't approve over 100 feet. In no case shall the Planning Commission approve a request for any freestanding center identification sign above 100 feet. I think what we're trying to put in here, and, and I added that so it can easily be taken out, um, was just not knowing the circumstance of future structures, buildings, whether they're um, man-made structures in a form of a, a over interchange or a tree that may block visibility, just giving somebody the provision to get a little bit taller. Um, but then the, the tree keeps getting taller too, right? So correct. So there's always going to be an issue. So there's always that. So they probably just so have to cut it to <coughs> fit. Not likely to get a tree above that height, but it is, I mean, the likely locations that these would go is, you know, we're looking around that service mutual interchange area where a structure for the interchange could, you know, have a significant impact to the visibility of that sign. So those would be, that would be the likely area where you'd want a little flexibility depending on where its location is relative to you know, that type of interchange because you've got a, a structure that's 30 feet, you know, uh, for visibility purposes it might need to go a little bit higher. And that's providing some provisions there, but if council's uncomfortable, that, that's an easy provision to st strike and leave it at 85. Essentially, since we went to from 50 to 85, I mean, you're getting the, the sign off the ground a considerable distance above uh, the ground, so it, it was trying to give flexibility, as Toby mentioned, but it's um, staff's perfectly acceptable with the 85 feet. Or if you say um, perhaps maybe we're just making the sign 90 feet tall instead of 
85. a provision here. We, we just tried to mimic what other partners within the county, um, other cities had kind of done. So if it's 85 feet, happy with that. Are we happy with 85 feet? No, it's fine. We're good. Okay. So he wants to strike that last sentence? I do. The rest of the council okay with that? I'm seeing head nods. Doesn't matter. Council member Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Indifferent. You make that noted. All right. Okay. Page 229. Final um, section G, final decision. The Planning Commission shall hear and determine the appeal and its decision shall be final. Does that mean they can appeal to the City Council? Sure. We're under removal of illegal signs procedure and its section G, final decision. I thought and I might be wrong, but I thought anything that went to the Planning Commission could be appealed to the City Council. I think. Yeah, I think what this section is referring to is if I make a decision and then um, the applicant doesn't like that, they can appeal my decision to the City Council, but I don't see why it should be restricted to just the Planning Commission either, so. I mean, don't we, don't, doesn't anything that goes to the planning commission can be appealed to the city council yes in order to be consistent with the remainder of the code it should be so my recommendation would be to add after final comma subject to appeal procedures and we'll cross reference in title one right title one. okay i had one on uh 228 i think we should consider striking one structurally altered so to extend its useful life because I, I mean if someone wanted to paint it I mean we wouldn't want something looking dilapidated and terrible and I could argue it's extending its useful life by painting it I would agree with the mayor so strike one yeah yeah everybody good there Page 232, the maximum height of the fence. And you already kind of talked about that. The remaining yard area, no fence shall exceed seven feet in height. But then from the highest elevation from the ground, as long as the overall height of the fence does not exceed eight feet. And I know even when we had six feet as being the height, there was still always the eight foot in there. And I think I understand that there can be a difference in elevation from a neighbor to a neighbor, but to me, why aren't you just going to leave it at seven feet? Because then technically somebody could wind up with an eight foot fence, right? Correct. And the, I mean, the challenge is. Why don't we just is, make it a flat seven foot fence? Well, just we know how subdivisions are built, and you recognize there's always going to be some differential between properties, and it comes down to where you're measuring it from. Right, so if the person, this scenario has happened pretty regularly where these are good neighbor fences, they're supposed to be shared costs. Right. But neighbor A says, hey, our fence has fallen down. I'm going to replace it. I'll do the work if you pay your share. And neighbor B says, no, I'm not paying for it. Neighbor says, well, I've got a pool. I've got to put a fence up. So he puts it up, and he puts it up six feet from his side. But on the other neighbor, who is seven feet, then calls to complain and say, hey, they built the fence too tall at seven feet. Well, then maybe we need to change the verbiage and say that it shall not exceed seven feet from the highest elevation. That would be. And then, and then it, there is no possibility that it goes above seven feet. That's, that's one option. We just like to give it as much flexibility as we can. Seven feet from the highest elevation of the yard? Yeah. Uh, where the fence is. No, because <laughs> you're, you're, I know where you're going. You're, you're mounding <laughs> well, up your backyard, yard. right? Uh, <laughs> my yard will end line. up with like a 12 foot fence. Then. <laughs> I meant, I meant Some nice fence. landscape mounds and your fence will do this, right? Yeah. I meant the fence line. Because yeah. now we're saying that it, it's six feet, but staff is recommending seven feet, but there's still the comment in there that it does not exceed eight feet. 
with the limitation today, we, the, the code reads today six feet not to exceed eight feet. So right now, the code gives you a two foot differential depending on retaining walls and that type of thing. So we're saying the base is seven, but still not to exceed eight. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. But again, why don't you just have a flat number? I get that yards aren't going to be the same, but... Just trying to cover as many possible scenarios out there as possible, because we okay, know... Okay, so why, why can't you put something in there that the seven feet is measured from the, the fence line at the highest level, and then you don't go to eight feet? Is that not... It's, it's policy decisions, whatever the council would like. It's, we're, again, knowing that the code's been six up to eight for many, many years, changing that could lead to some fences being out of compliance. I don't think it's a big number. Yeah, but, but aren't they grandfathered in? Until they have to be replaced. Okay. I'm and then they're still going to get seven feet because their neighbor maybe has the, the taller yard versus their yard, so they're still going to have seven feet. I like that two-foot variance. Uh, yeah, I, we I, go I, seven foot, yeah. then I can have a nine-footer on my side. <laughs> No, See you wouldn't. Again? You wouldn't have eight. No, the, the way it's written, you couldn't have nine. Eight's the highest you can get. Well, as I said, but I like you said earlier, they had a two foot variance from a six to an eight. That's so I'd like to keep the two foot variance. So you, well, yeah, you're the, you're two are opposite then, right? <laughs> so she's saying seven foot flat. You're saying seven plus two. He's he's. Just I well, I like <laughs> the six to the eight, and then I can, you know, at my home, for instance, there is a county home behind me that has a tall fence. And so my fence comes along and right at the end, the contractor stepped it up right. so that he could get it up to where it's, it's as high as that fence. Otherwise it would chop right off and there'd be a foot drop. So I think the variance is okay. Or the six to eight. So right now we have it seven feet. No, we have, he's, he's saying stick with our current, which is six yeah, I, I would say stick with the current, but. Six, but it can go up to eight when there's a differential. Yeah. I'd be okay with that. In terms of those situations we've had, Tom, if we leave that language, it doesn't address those particular things because the some of those issues are again what you have is people buy these fence posts and they come as six feet. It's a six foot tall fence post, and if they put any type of kickboard, it's over six feet. So if if people aren't paying attention, aren't cutting the bottom of those boards, then you end up with a fence that's over six feet. The other thing is if somebody does a six foot fence and then puts a, a course of lattice work on the top, now it's seven feet <laughs> tall. Uh, those, could, they, those could, could they do that though, put up a seven foot and then put lattice on top of it as <coughs> well? Um, they can do anything they want until enforcement comes and knocking on the door. Is, latti <laughs> is lattice on top considered as part of the fence? Yep, it's part of the fence because it's screwed to the fence. Okay. So. Um, I think that the reason that, you know, I put this provision in there and talked with Toby about it is um, in the nearly 20 years that I've worked for this city, one of the number one complaints that I get is how tall can my fence be? And at six feet, um, there's not a lot of latitude there. So we, we, we snuck in the suggestion to have it to seven, which recently the California Building Code said you can have uh, fences up to seven feet tall to give some of uh, some ability for folks to have a little bit taller fence on their on their property. So I think at seven feet, it probably eliminates some of the code issues Most, yeah, um, within the community. Um, maybe it doesn't capture everybody, but it gives people the ability to have a little bit taller fence. So well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm okay with keeping it six to eight, but I don't know how the rest of the council feels. I would agree with the mayor. So the, so the language would read, no fence shall exceed, as it reads today, six feet in height from the highest elevation from the ground as long as the overall height of the fence does not exceed eight feet measured from the lowest elevation. So, so that means you can have an eight-foot fence. But that's only if you've got a two-foot differential between properties. Right, because on one side it can't I be know, more than six. That's not what I was saying. That so you can't exceed six. Can't exceed six on on like the low side. Eight. They can't exceed eight on the high side. The seven. No, I, I like the seven to eight. So you know, seven foot fence. Yeah. But it can't exceed eight. And the, and the reason why I, I I can agree with that is because again, my yard sits up a little bit higher. I'm sure my neighbor would love 
me to put a it's, taller than six foot fence because right. I sit up there, I can see his whole backyard. Exactly. And, you and know, that's they have a the idea. Pool and they probably prefer me not being up there, you know, but. That's exactly what this provision is giving your your yard is the exact reason why we propose the seven so you're saying six feet six feet no i'm i'm saying whatever it's as is drafted seven it's seven seven is drafted as seven no higher than eight i can i i, I like that yep yeah so we got one yeah that's fine two <coughs> brett you good okay. sure everybody's good all right we'll leave it as is thank you <laughs> moving along Page 239, Aviaries. The consent, which is under B1, the original consent was the applicant shall obtain written consent of his or her immediate neighbor sharing a common property line and not less than 75% of property owners and tenants within a radius of 300 feet. And it looks like it was changed that the 75% approval includes their immediate neighbors so that's the way i'm reading it so it's now all grouped in to be part of the 75 percent instead of the neighbor on either side that's going to be affected they both have to agree to it and then 75 percent of neighbors 300 feet away is the way i'm reading the new consent I think you're reading it correctly. Okay. Council so Moreno. it's not right because to me, the people that are going to be living right next door to the aviary, they should have, it, it should really, it's going to affect them more than people who are 300 feet away. So it should be the original consent, which was both people on either side of you and then 75% of people that are within 300 feet. So is it just an and? Right, so applicant shall obtain written consent of his or her immediate neighbors and not less, right? And not less than 75%. Well, that, that would fix it, but the way it reads now, it reads like the 75% includes the immediate neighbors. Right. Yeah, so they change the of to an and and that fixes that, right? Yes. Okay. Bring up an interesting question um, re regarding any animals or birds. What about in county islands? That's subject to the county's code, not ours. So if they uh, if they allow uh, you know yep. goats and chickens and yep. even if it's within our city limits. Well, not in our city limits. Well, well if we're all surrounded influence. and it's a county island. It's a county island. It is subject to their jurisdiction, all their jurisdiction. It's It's not ours. Okay until we annex it, and then it becomes ours. <laughs> okay. You know, we can always talk to the county about de-annexing things. We, you know, I'm sure there's a few things that Jim would like to have back. <laughs> we can get him to put in the curb and gutter and sidewalks, too. That's what I'm thinking. We'll give it back, and then yeah. we can do some improvements and give it back to us. Right, Jim? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As they are, right? <laughs> You digress, All right? Continuing. Page 251, B4, line two. It says, shall be screened from public view by a minimum seven foot tall. So the six foot number was stricken, but it needs to, the six foot written needs to be changed to seven, seven. feet. Yep. Okay, and the next one is page 262. And it's admi <coughs> excuse me, administrative permits. And it's being recommended that administrative permits can now operate 365 days instead of 180 days. And that specifically was the request from what I saw here from the snow cone people. That's correct. Yep, Tom's worked with them. So they're only going to is that trying to put them in line with 
say a food truck? Is that what the intent is? Not, not necessarily. Um, the owner mm -hmm. came in um, and talked to me about this. Um, essentially, that building is difficult to move and store um, each year, and so it has to be moved and brought back um, two times a year. And so the request from her was simply to allow the building to stay there all year round so that they didn't have to move it. So does that mean that they would be open year round or just? They would like to have the ability to uh, maybe in the winter time, this time of the year, be able to sell coffees or something like that. Um, kind of a hot beverage item. But again, that's kind of along the, the food truck, right? And do we allow food trucks to be open 365? Because then now our food truck's going to say we want the same benefit that administrative permit. Correct. I mean, or if she could invest in a food truck and drive it wherever she wishes, you know, under that scenario, if she doesn't necessarily have to have the little building. Okay. The food trucks, aren't we going to possibly just make that uh, 365 days a year you, after we look at the 180 yeah, days? Yeah, so the, you, gave us a, you gave us a year from September, so in September we'll be reviewing, or before September we'll be reviewing that whole program and that'll be a council policy decision of what you want to do. And so now we're getting more since since it was extended uh, mm -hmm. uh, beyond the six months to a year that that, um, that the council gave, we're seeing some interest in some applications. There's still only been a couple that have actually been um, approved. So we don't have really a good track record on how these things are operating yet. And so we're hopeful by the uh, September 2020 date is when that expiration um, expires for that pilot program to have a better sample size to recommend to the council what we should do moving forward. But, but this the, is a little this is a little different with the with the snow cone right, shack. But the food trucks, they come and go. They don't stay stationary whereas the snow cone trailer there all sits the time. there. Yep. And it, it's gonna sit there. Yeah, my concern is that's a slippery slope too. What if we had one of our businesses like say Home Depot wanted to take a storage container and plop it out in the front dress it up couple cut a couple of entrances and put a commercial kitchen in it and start using it it's not on a separate parcel yeah, certainly the intent with this administrative permit for the snow cone shacks was um, albeit temporary in nature and that's why the 180 day limit was applied in the first place I think I would still like to leave the administrative permit at 180 days myself. Yeah, and I, I would I would kind of agree because if it turns into 365, then it's a permanent business. And do Just we hold them to the same standards as far as you know, underground power and everything like? Well, the 365 we do our, just means it's an annual permit under that scenario. What's that? It would just be an annual permit under 365. They're coming in on an annual basis versus a semi-annual basis. But they would be yeah, permitted to Yeah, but it's like it's permanent. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to tell them no after they've been doing what? it for four years. Unless there's a bad track record, and you have the ability to not issue it. Yeah, not likely. I guess my concern was is, you know, and this is me maybe being devious, but let's just say I have somebody who has a, a business out there and I want to start a business and I just want to plop something up and run some conduit across the asphalt and and get me my 365 day permit and I'm good to go do I have to pay any any of our the, the uh, permit fees that we would uh, a fixed business no just an admin permit and then correct yeah. so we don't get the, we don't get the school fees and all that other things that come along with the brick and mortar but they're operating every day like a brick and mortar. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, that, yeah. That, that there's where I'm having a little bit of a problem with it because we're allowing something that we are now fostering what we don't want. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty unique. I mean, there's very few that fit this criteria. doesn't matter oh, whether but, it's unique. But they can. It, it could be the norm. So leave it as 180 as it was. Because if we're going to allow this, I know a great place I could plop a place down and not have to go through <laughs> this. So just a comment i i would like to leave it as it is 180 180 yep but there's four other council members I, i'm gonna agree with you about 180. if it's 365 i would just say then they need to go through the process of making that building permanent like every other business has to do yep you, you can't have a 365 day permit and get away with the temporary requirements if you know what i mean 
Yep. That's, that's yep. all I'm saying. Is that going to affect the food trucks, though, when that comes back no, to us? It's, in, it's, in, it's in separate. In mobile. No, it's we would separate. address. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All that would be addressed. Okay. Moving on. I I don't have any more stickies. <gasps> wow. I got one. What? One? One, and I'm done. We're at the end. Yeah, we're going to be done early tonight from oh, these things. Not done yet. Hey, yeah, careful, careful. So mine is on page 265. It's in relationship to the comments, looks like, by James Michaels and the attorney um, when they're talking about um, uh, extension of the proposals to 24 months instead of a 12 months. Um, and the attorney says they need to leave it at 12 months. What's the big difference between why and why not? I'll let the legal answer the, the legal side of it. From a staff perspective, we're trying to get it consistent with the rest of our um, you know, extension time frame. So um, we think it's more consistent to be 24 months across the board. So I don't know if there's anything. I don't think there's a prohibition against it. It was just a recommendation to have the, to have mm -hmm. it try to match with the government code with the tentative map, but it's fine it's, if, if the policy decision is to make it 24 then. Because normally even if it's 12 months, they usually come back and get a one year extension. Correct, and that's why so we're starting with 24 months. To if, so they're going to get their 24 months, so why can't we just move it to 24 months? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Because yeah, I know uh, almost all of, well, not all of ours, but a good majority of our development projects, the housing ones, right? they're not going to go within 12 it's months. pretty difficult these I don't days even think they'll go within going. 24 months. So I think we should move it to 12, 24 months and, yeah. and take, it out, take it out. Yeah, that's what we got. Because none of them pencil. That's what we're proposing is 24. That's all of mine. Toby, do we want to mention that discussion we, you and I had had about the uh, question that was posed to us in the industrial areas relative to somebody living in a building? Yeah, so we've had the question come up, uh, so it's not in the code, but the question came up regarding uh, the ability to allow for, and there's no provisions in our code today, to allow for occupation of an industrial building. So we've had this situation come up on a code enforcement a number of times where folks are illegally living in an industrial space and they've created a makeshift type of operation within those and we've you know proceeded with a code enforcement violation on those but there's been asked a number of times um, whether there's any provisions or any way to legalize that from a staff perspective we don't think that's a good idea uh, we just any number of problems we've had um, with that type of situation it just does not seem to be a proper mixture of uses between a residential use and an industrial facility. Um, you know, the only thing you can come even close to it is the guard shack type of conversation, but again, that's staffed for a period of time, and uh, we don't believe it's something that would be consistent in an industrial. Um, on the commercial side of things, you know, you've got mixed use components where you'd have residential, you know, ab above a um, commercial use, that type of thing, but in industrial, we have a difficult time finding that uh, combination of uses to be consistent with the rest of the code, but wanted to bring it up. It's something that we could considered, but that did not include. But if the council wants us to, to reconsider, we would look for your direction on that item. Thanks, Tom, for reminding me. So now you're talking just commercial use. I mean, not commercial, industrial use. So the, the, the question yeah. came specific right. up for an industrial use on whether there would be any provisions to allow for that to be occupied on some level on a residential basis. You know, somebody can actually live in an industrial building? I would say no. I would in say no. Industrial's industrial, it shouldn't be residential. It's generally incompatible with residential uses. I would agree, and, and, and for the sheer fact that, let's just say we're talking a 100,000 square foot building or something like that, and there was multiple people living there, the environmental impact reports done on the zoning never factored in the traffic of that magnitude or the sewer or the water demands and everything, so I think residential need to stay in residential, and if we ultimately want to allow residential in an industrial area, we create a separate zoning for that that studies those things exactly. and approves them before they come. That, that's just my thought. Any others? Everybody agree? Everybody agrees? Okay. All right. So do you want to have any other discussion? Ne really talking about next steps or any questions for the public, or it's up to you? Um, uh, at this time, I mean, we've gone over so many things. I, I, I would think, um, and we're not adopting anything. We're just giving you direction, right. right? So why don't you clean them up, 
then you'll be bringing them back to us in what, two weeks? So here's the schedule, perfect segue. So um, this item, as it's presented this evening, will go to the Planning Commission on February 3rd, so next, next Monday. Um, our, our newest Planning Commissioner will get it indoctrinated by fire with a nice 300-page item. Um, and then uh, public hearing for this is scheduled to come back on February 24th with an adoption public hearing on March 9th. So okay. this, this title would be under the schedule, if we can hold it, to be effective on May 1st. And then what's coming next, uh, so group two, so titles 9, 10, and 19 would come back on the next meeting, February 10th. And then um, public hearing for group four would be on that same night, so our next meeting. And then everything accumulates to adoption of pretty much all the remaining titles on March 9th. Okay. Um, so I, what I'm thinking is, is we'll have you clean them this section up, yep. then at the next meeting, then I'll open it up for the public comment so that we can be on February 24th when this would come back for a public hearing. Correct. And can we do this and then take their comments at that point and either that's adjust them done. or not adjust them? Right, because I think that was a public hearing that's scheduled technically before our first reading and adoption. Correct. Yeah. So we 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 scheduled this. This would be the same we've done with every other title. It's a public hearing. You take public comment, but it's not set up for adoption. That would come at the following meeting. So, so do any we changes? take the comment now or take it? Okay. Well, yeah. you so can do we'll take it because way. because there, we've made so many changes. It's better to get a clean copy so that everybody can. And we've done it both ways throughout this process, just depending okay. on that level of input. So, okay. it's either way works. Okay. So, are there any other questions on the policy or the procedure? No. Okay. Okay. With that, we will move to council member referrals. Is there anyone on the council that would like to have an item placed on a future agenda? I would like to place something on the future agenda as far as a discussion item would be swearing in of new police officers and fire that they would do it. Maybe how, I don't know if the POA or if the, the fire would like to do it, but do it at the beginning of a city council meeting so all of us are here. Okay. So it's not, you know, some other time after the swearing in, you know, they can be excused and go into the big room and, and do their greeting and stuff. But I think that we should at least discuss. I think it's great. I, I think it's a good idea too. Do we need to bring that up or just give that direction now? You can give that direction. I, uh, the, the only challenge is just scheduling if you're not, the swearing in versus trying to get somebody on the ground here versus having to wait two weeks. Um, you know, the ceremony aspect for the council to see that person, um, it's probably easier for us to come introduce any new person. Just, I'm just a little hesitant timing wise of waiting for a, a city council meeting or schedule with the city council meeting because that's every two weeks. And if for some reason a council meeting gets missed, for example, over the holidays, we have a meeting in the first week of December, we don't have another one until January, we're trying to swear a new officer, we gotta wait. That's my only hesitation, but we'll take whatever direction the council has. Well, then we hire them all in November, and we don't hire anybody in December. Oh, we sure wish it was that easy. <laughs> no, I, yeah, but, I, but I heard him say he can make it happen. So, yeah. It's, but, it's, but I heard, yeah, because I bring this up because you know they do have a informal swearing in, and I did it. I did attend the last one that you know an officer was informally swore, sworn in to to get going and everything like that, and we would just have a formal swearing in before the city council meeting. So, so the other aspect that I want to bring up is we formed a committee inside our um, city staff that's looking at employee recognitions and one of the uh, recommendations that came out of that committee uh, the first meeting last time was recognizing all employees in a similar way when they come through either at passing probation or some other way of bringing folks introduced. So uh, if it's okay with the council, I would, if I could have a little bit of time to kind of vet both of these concepts and bring you back a little something a little more structured to kind of do both. Right, so that it introduces new employees to the council at the same time recognizes those police and safe, you know, fire, fire and uh, police positions. Is that acceptable mm -hmm. approach? Or, I mean, I, I, we, we can discuss this more when you and me meet one on one. But to me, you know, and I've talked to you about this before, about six months ago. Um, you know, when it comes to public safety, it's a it's a completely different aspect. So, and that's why I was asking for public safety, you know, to be sworn in uh, before the, the city council. I mean, if you'd like to be at this, the discussion topic, we'll have him put it on the agenda. Put it on agenda. Or could we even discuss that at our goal setting? Goal setting would be a, yeah. a perfect opportunity. It's on there. February 1st. That's fine. Put it on the goal setting. Got it. Okay. 
Anyone else? Okay, we'll move to reports. Um, I have nothing to report. Council member. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Council member Klein? Nothing. Vice Mayor Rhino? Nothing tonight. Council member Drop it? Nothing. Council member Khan? Sure, my next city office hours will be Saturday, February 8th from 12 to 2 here at the community center. Okay. Um, Atija? Nothing? Nubia? Uh, Mr. Wells? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just a couple items to highlight uh, is on your calendar is the Chamber uh, Installation Dinner is this Friday, uh, 6 p.m. here at the Community Center. Get your tickets before the event. They're not going to be sold at the, at the door. Um, just to highlight that uh, I will be attending the League of California City City Manager Conference. It's in a terrible little place called Napa, and that's the week of 5th uh, through the 7th. Um, and then just highlighting the Beautification Committee. Um, invitations have been sent out to all of the committee members and it is scheduled for February 4th at 5.30 here in the Community Center. So uh, we've got acceptance and we'll be moving, look, working on a, an agenda to get out to the committee members this week. Thank you. Tom? Daniel? Rick? Kevin? Kevin, sorry. Test. There we go. All right, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, just wanted to let you know that our apparatus committee is headed to South uh, Dakota tomorrow morning for midpoint inspection of our apparatus. Um, also, just to let everybody know, we're being very village diligent about the uh, coronavirus that's going around. We're, we're on a health alert, so we're, we're looking at that. There's about 100 people in the United States that are currently being looked at for that virus that came from China. Also, our new BC's vehicle is in service finally. Uh, last week, we put it in service full time. Also, if you haven't <coughs> been out to uh, our station out on Service Road, you're going to you have been seeing a lot of fire engines around town coming in and out for training. You probably see a lot of them in Mitchell and a lot of them down, coming down Crow's Landing, so that's a good thing to have all those fire engines rolling through town. And tonight marks my one year anniversary with the city. Thank you. Great. Congratulations. Chief Wise, you know it is customary that when you reach that one year, you bring cake. Did anyone tell you that? They missed that. Shoot, Toby? <laughs> Jeremy? Supervisor Demartini. This is Mayor. I just for what it's worth, the uh, city of Newman swears in their police and fire at their council meetings. Always has. So, so that's where you stole the idea, huh, Mike? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think we do that here. I go to all their meetings there, and that's the only city that actually does that, both fire and police. And then after they swear them in, the city pays for some cookies and. Well, Nubia would know that because she, she goes to that too. They have some light refreshments and actually adjourn the meeting for 15 minutes. So Great. Mention that. Thank you. Okay, with that, we will adjourn to our next regularly scheduled meeting, which will be held on February 10th at 6 p.m. Thank you.